This channel is part of the History Hit Network. Welcome to the Cotswolds, one of the most affluent addresses in Roman Britain. The countryside around me is crammed with Roman villas and roads and towns, but we're interested in one particular Roman desres, which we're pretty sure once stood in this field. Because these finds from a small dig here 23 years ago suggest an opulent villa built within years of the Roman occupation. And what's more, it's sited unusually close to two other villas. Once we've got the archaeological evidence from under here, we'll be trying to paint a picture of the Roman Cotswold family who lived here almost two millennia ago. And as usual, we've got just three days to do it. In 1978, an exploratory trench was dug in this field five miles from Cheltenham. Although the find suggested the existence of one of the Cotswolds' earliest Roman villas, no further investigation took place, until now, as we attempt to discover the whole story of the villa in Waltham Field. Mick, why are you so confident there's something interesting here? Well, there was an excavation done here in the 70s by a local chap, and we're pretty sure it's somewhere in this field, aren't we, Phil? Well, I mean, I think it seems to be pretty well um, precisely uh, located. I mean, it says here it's two metres from the hedge line, which is two metres off that hedge line, mm. and 59 metres from field gate on the north side, which is that gate over there. So if we come 59 oh. metres up there and two metres off that hedge line, we should get it. Yeah. You've your first, haven't you? Yeah, if you look at the results, Tony, whether that's the trench, mm. I'm not sure. It could be just beyond there. It's about the right place, though, yeah. isn't it? But, yeah. I mean, the thing that's important is we're getting clear suggestions mm. of wall lines that look like a building. Yeah, so our logic is for us to put a trench along the hedge there and find the edges of this earlier mm. chap's trench, because it's always useful to reopen trenches like that. Do you think we should have a look at these supposed wall lines as well and see what they really are? I'm yeah. sure it's going through on this sort of alignment. <laughs> yeah. So if we do a trench across that... Yeah, and you're only halfway through doing the geophys anyway, aren't they? So if we start yeah. that, and then we see what you get over that area as well. Yeah. So we can get on with that now. Which one do you fancy doing? Oh, what do you want? Well, you've won. <laughs> well, no, I mean, I'm, I'm quite happy to test this guy's um, surveying, really. That's right? the logic. Fascinating. You, <laughs> yeah. you take the middle <laughs> one. All right, I'll take the middle okay. one, yeah. History hit is like Netflix, just for history fans with exclusive history documentaries covering some of the most famous people and events in history just for you. Our extensive catalogue of documentaries covers everything from the rise of Hannibal Barker to the illustrious treasures of King Tut. So sign up today for broadcast quality documentaries uncovering the mysteries of the ancient world. We're committed to bringing history fans award-winning documentaries and podcasts that you cannot find anywhere else. Sign up now for a free trial. And Odyssey fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code ODYSSEY at checkout. So we'll put in a trench to find and extend the excavation carried out by Mr Wilf Cox in 1978, while Carenza will dig a second trench to help us interpret Geophys's early results for the site. Apart from discovering the size and style of the building, there's another mystery to be solved. The villa we're digging is, in Roman terms, unusually close to two other villas. A 19th century investigation suggested one at Arl Grove, a kilometre northwest of our field, or just off your screen to the right, while just over half a kilometre southeast of the site are the scheduled remains of Whittington Court, a fantastic Roman house excavated in 1948. There is, just beyond that big house there, Yeah. evidence of a Roman villa, isn't there? Yeah. And about a kilometre over that way... There's another one. 
Yeah. So why the heck would there be one here? Well, there are a lot of Roman villas in the Cotswolds, you know. There's Spoonley Wood that way, there's Turkdean that we did on, on earlier programmes, there's Chedworth, which is, you know, one that people can visit. There's a lot in this area, it's one of the densest areas. Quite why this one's here in relation to that one, only 500 metres away, we need to think about. But we don't know much about this one, so it's a geophys job and, you know, putting the trenches in. Hopefully we will by the end of the three days. Well, it'd be nice if we could find you another mosaic, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I've heard that one before, but we are off to a flying start. Oh, that one no, there. it's got to be that one. It's only it's taken Jenny, one. Phil and Katie a couple of minutes to confirm we're in the 1978 trench. We've got to be somewhere there. It's yeah. a lot broader, a lot broader there, and then it, it, just, it, does, it just tapers in. Yeah. We haven't quite got anything in there. Mm. Yeah, I reckon we're in there. Now, this trench was originally dug after the tenant farmer's daughter literally stumbled across evidence of a villa. I was in the field when Dad was haymaking and I just sort of kicking in the molehills as you do and uh, found this piece here, I think, and either this one or that one. Did you know how significant it was? Well, I thought they were because the year before I'd been helping with a dig locally and um, so I'd sort of started to get clued in on these bits and pieces. And then, of course, once you started, you start picking up more bits. And... What do these finds tell us? Well, we've got pottery from occupation, but the interesting thing for us is that even if we hadn't surveyed the place or done geophys, we've got bits of a whole building here, wall plaster. We've got bits of flooring, and we've also got two completely different types of roof tile. And the pots give you a good spread. Most of the sort of things, the Samian and so on, Late, late first, second, even third century. But most of it's quite early. Most of it's quite early. What would you like us to discover over the next day or so? I'd like you to find all the pottery in the building, a few bits on the top, and that mean it had finished off quite early. Why might it have finished off? Well, you've got the <coughs> villa down by the church, mm. and that doesn't seem to have been built until the fourth century. Yeah, it's very easy just to look at a map and see Roman villas all over the place and think of them all being here at the same time. The Romans were here for nearly 400 years. Some houses were built, burnt down, reoccupied, changed, altered, yeah. adapted. There's all sorts of things that could have happened to this place. So perhaps with any luck, we'll develop that story here and find out whether this place has got an unusual history. So the mystery deepens. The evidence suggests the villa we're investigating may actually be a very early example of a Romano-British building. Hopefully, Carenza and Trench 2 will give us some clues as to what it looked like. But we're not just relying on the trenches to solve the mysteries posed by this site. The site sits within two dry valleys, doesn't yeah. it? This one's still yeah. got a stream going down it. And, yeah. and it looks as like if there's a change in the geology and the water is, is basically springing out at the point where the villa is situated. Stuart thinks the surrounding land may also offer clues. And he's interested in how our villa connects to the rest of the Cotswolds, starting with the nearby Roman market town of Wickham. So this is the nearest town or small yeah, town to our site. Originally it's thought to be a smallish settlement, but yeah. over the years, and particularly seeing this turn here... Turn left, Bill, turn left. This settlement has got bigger and bigger and oh, bigger. Oh, look at that now, look. You can <laughs> see buildings all over you it. Can, can't you? Wow! Well, on this side as well. And here, look. That's fantastic. But, I mean, there is a perfect example of, of crop marks. Yeah. Given the layout of a big Roman settlement. I don't think this, this is actually a fabulous way to find Roman roads. Yeah. It's much better than walking. <laughs> <laughs> Down below is the Foss Way, the main yeah. road between Exeter and, and Lincoln, isn't it? It's still very direct, isn't it? Exactly. And these, as you're saying, these are what you assume, assume to be people assume to be the main Roman roads. They're the motorways, the motorways of Roman yeah. Britain, aren't they, really? The, yeah. Linking all these roads into the villas, into the fields, are all great networks of smaller roads. Yeah. I think part of our task this weekend to try and see how many of those survive round our villa complex, whether there's any new things to be found. I shall expect you to have it sorted out by the third day. <laughs> right. Okay. Back on the ground, our first two trenches show the 1970s excavation just scratched the surface of this massive site. You happy now, Phil? Yeah. Or <laughs> ecstatic. But although we're coming up with plenty of evidence for early Roman occupation, we haven't yet found the large features that we need to reconstruct the villa. How's it going down here, Carenza? <laughs> I wish I knew. We're still sort of really at the mm. rubbly, rather 
unclear what's going on there. We're just planning everything now. Yep. Uh, but there's no, nothing very definite in the way of features coming up yet. So who do you think was living here then? The probability is that the local aristocracy adopted Roman ways, but were also used by the Romans as administrators in their local, their local town councils. I mean, it's unlikely to be a Roman from Italy come over, oh, isn't absolutely it? Absolutely not. That's because people here will have understood that being a Roman had certain material advantages. It was a trade-off. They were given Roman power, but they also they found that Roman ways of life were quite attractive. We know that from literary sources. We know it from inscriptions. So there's a lot of evidence to support that case. It's now mid-afternoon on day one, and despite the promising geophys, we still seem to have more questions than answers. But at last, Phil seems to have hit the jackpot, or at least a floor. Look at that, it's got an opus signinum floor. Oh, so wow, we're so absolutely nice. into a building. Right. There's no question of it. That has so got to be, that is our first definite Roman. So uh, that's floor. actually undisturbed inside the building then? That's exactly it. That's good, isn't it? We've got some green plaster turning up. Oh, oh, wow. Look at that. <laughs> so you've got the floor and you've got the plaster that's falling off the that's wall right. now. That's right, yeah. Oh, yes, that's nice. I mean, we're definitely now getting into the building. Yeah. That's great, isn't it? So does that, does that square with what you've got on there? That's where we said the wall line came through, so that matches well, coming this now, way. What about the general alignment that you'd picked up this morning? Well, let's go across to this trench. I mean, I've got the wall line sort of on this axis. Yeah. And oh yes, there you are yes. in the trench. So you can see that wall alignment there in the middle of the trench. So the actual uh, angle, the alignment, is a bit skewed it to is. the the hedge and the trench. Yeah. It's a bit off like that. Well, since this morning you've completed the rest of that area over there, haven't you? And you can see we've got sort of rectilinear arrangement of wall foundations. So you might have buildings around a courtyard or something like that. So what we plan to do is put another trench in just yep. across here. Oh, somewhere across here? Yeah, because I, I think there should be another wall line coming through, through this side, yeah. parallel to that one. OK, so we'll put this in next. Yeah, and in the meantime, we're going the other side of the hedge yeah, that's to actually logic, follow Phil's floor yeah. and the walls on that side. So hopefully Trench 3 will explain what we've been investigating so far, because it now seems that we're not looking at a villa in this field at all, but probably some sort of courtyard. The high-status Roman home we're searching for is obviously nearby, so the next set of geophys results can't come soon enough. But with almost a whole day spent digging and little to show for it, the tension's beginning to tell. Nothing can distract our diggers as they try to untangle the archaeology. On the plus side, though, we now know the soil in this field is consistently shallow, so we can use a mini digger to help speed things up. We're all now desperate to see the results of the latest geophys. Pressure John could do without. The site is massive, and he's got an awful lot of blips to interpret. But as we approach the end of day one, we shouldn't be too pessimistic. We've got a bit of Roman wall popping up in that trench there. We've had lots of Roman tiles and roofing slates there. And just out of that trench about five minutes ago, we got this lovely little piece of hypercourse tile with this pattern that's actually been rolled onto it. But basically, the whole thing's been pretty rubbly. Not much sight of a villa at all, except in Phil's trench. Phil, what have you got? Well, basically, we're in the corner of a room, Tony, which is going that way. Into this field? Into that field. Which is where John's been geophysing for the last couple of hours. John! <laughs> yeah, we're through here, <laughs> Tony. Oh, is this yeah. it? No, those are the results from that field. You've just climbed through that boundary. But look, look here. Oh, very nice. Walls extending for at least another 40 metres. Look, double walls at this point. And it's all on the same alignment as the walls we've got in the other field. But it's not forming a particular plan we can recognise not at, at the, the moment. moment, is it? No. But look at this. Big curving ditch on that side. We're going to have to put a trench through that, but there's all these other walls and things to look at as well. Tomorrow? Yeah, there's a lot of work to do. And no one's ever dug for archaeology in this field ever before. Join us after the break. What do you think that is there? Beginning of day two, and yesterday morning, everything seemed so simple. There was evidence of a Roman villa in this field. That's what we'd find. 
but by yesterday afternoon, geophysics was coming up with something so complex and confusing that it looked more like Gatwick Airport than a Roman villa. And if that wasn't problematic enough, the whole thing seemed to be lurching off into this field. And we still haven't got the full extent of it. It seems to be huge. And there's this weird ditch-like feature in the corner of the geophys. Mick. What's going on? Well, yeah, we, we've got a problem. We're not quite sure of the extent of the site in any direction. And what we have got on the geophysics doesn't really look like any sort of villa plan that we know from the Cotswolds. And what's this? Probably a, an Iron Age ditch, but because it cuts through, or appears to cut through, these two dark areas, which is probably Roman building rubble, it's just possible that it might be a post-Roman feature. Dark Ages? Yeah, which would be... Fantastic. Really. Because so little archaeology survives from Absolutely, that yeah. So what are we going to do? Well, we're going to dig a trench the other side of the hedge from where we started yesterday in Phil's Trench. Phil's Trench, where we've got this uh, interesting little corner of Roman floor. Yeah, and we, we just want to see if those remains carry on into this field, because that, that's, you know, the, the best Roman building we've got at the moment. But other than that, I'm, I'm inclined to wait an hour or so until we've got a lot more geophysics for the area around. Because if we can get something like the extent and we, the complete plan, then we might have a better idea of which bit to target next for the sort of living area of the villa. Are we going to dig the ditch? I'm thinking about it, yeah. I oh, mean, come on, we've got to. <laughs> I mean, if we get a few more people, we could probably have a crack at it, yeah. So geophys will continue their monumental survey of this site. And as we now know the depth of the soil in these fields, we can use a mini digger to help extend Phil's trench onto the other side of the hedge as he continues to hunt for the main villa building. You do come a bit if you like, yeah? I mean, we might as well get it right up to the edge. Right, let's have a bit of a trowel up then. The villa we thought we had in our original field on the left now appears to be a courtyard most probably a farmyard, and the evidence we've accumulated suggests it wasn't all built at the same time. Richard, we've obviously got stone roofing material and clay roof tile, so presumably we've got two different roofs. What's going on? Well, it's not only two different roofs, but two different methods of making the roof. The Roman idea brings over with it large flat tiles with flanges, and then obviously there's a space for the rain to get in, so you cap the flanges with the half moons. Right, so you get a series of tiles and then little ridges, just like pan tiles. Yeah, really. yeah. But then at some stage, somebody goes round and has the idea that stone will do just as well. But it's a complete revolution because you're overlapping them in a totally different way so that you can build up a pattern with the tiles covering the gaps. Same sort of thing, but somebody's had a completely new way of doing it. Do you think there's a difference in date between the two different ways of building the roof? I think there must be. I think this, well, archaeologically, uh, most of these d turn up in early deposits. These seem not to turn up till the later periods. The Cotswolds were at the heart of the Roman agricultural effort. And as part of our investigation into this site, we've enlisted Peter Reynolds to help us reconstruct a piece of Roman farm machinery. Peter, what are you doing with this rustic Lego kit? <laughs> <laughs> what I'm doing is making a Roman, Roman tribulum. What's a tribulum? A threshing sledge. How does it work? Well, what you've got are four pieces of oak like this. We're going to curve the front end, put a big block of stone on here, and that's where you sit, hitch it up to a horse, have some straw with the ears on it, Run it round and round and ah, see how right. it chops yes. it all up. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely fascinating thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, the Romans did take their agriculture pretty seriously, didn't they? Well, yeah, I mean, they, they were very productive. I mean, he knows more about than anybody because he's, he's, he's replicated a lot of it. You, know, you see, arguably, one of the reasons why the Romans came to Britain was the agriculture here was superb. When they came, they profited by that. And I think they brought with them new things, like the scythe, for example. And perhaps they brought this as well. Yeah. You know, just in order to get more and more out, more profit. It's all about investment and profit taking. Yeah. So would the people who lived in our villa basically have been farmers? Oh, I think so. I mean, even if there was a, an aristocracy, if we could call it that, in the big house, they would ultimately have derived their wealth from, from the farmland around. And, uh, you know, there would have been a hive of industry of people processing whatever they were doing. There would be lots of barns and sheds, rather like here, you know, to process the material and then send it off to 
the markets, the nearest market towns, the Roman army elsewhere. Because yeah. it, was, it was in the third or fourth century when the Roman army on the Rhine ran out of food, they imported it from Britain, yeah. right? To take care of a huge problem out there in terms of supplies. That gives you some idea of the wealth, if you like, of the agriculture here. Yeah. It was enormous. Back on site, we're beginning to discover evidence of what that wealth might have been spent on. This that's is nice. the this is the bit that's intriguing me. What do you make of that? Ooh! Hey! You like that? Yeah. Well, you obviously like it. Wait a <laughs> oh yeah. Now this really is something. It's black terra negra, and it's got an actual stamp well, on. Yeah. Yeah. Whoops. Remember, if anything happens to this, it's your fault. You're supervising me doing this. Oh. Ooh. Is that any better? I's and O's and possibly an N. The plate stamp turns out to belong to someone copying the style of the master Roman potter, Nonicus. This high status piece of terra nigra tableware was originally manufactured in northeast France between 50 and 70 AD, and it suggests the people who lived here saw themselves as sophisticated. It also adds to the evidence that we're digging a very early Roman building. So this is really high status pots? It's stuff for the fashionable market, yeah. And you're going to have to pay for this if you want it, because you're going to import it from the Rhineland. And we have got here high status people living within, what, 20 years yeah. of the invasion? Yeah, round about the invasion, plus 20 or something like that, already importing stuff and paying for it. OK. I'll so leave it up to you, then. Yeah. While the intrigue continues in the trenches, geophys are beginning to get a grip on the massive amount of information that lies just below the surface. <laughs> we got a nice road in. This discovery of a possible road down which our high status finds would have come could also be very useful to Stuart as he tries to work out why three villas were built so close together. What we've got at the moment, Maya, are these printouts of where there are Roman sites and Roman villas in this yeah. area. They're not particularly usable like this. What I'd like to do is get them against the, the modern base map the villa sites there and if we can plot them on here it mm. make a lot of difference in terms of understanding yeah. what's going on. The lie of the land seems to be very important to the sighting of our villa. So we're converting the 2D world of Stuart's maps into a 3D computer model of the area. A time-consuming process for Ray San as he has to trace every contour and feature in the two kilometres around our site. Phil? Yeah? Should you really have some window glass? Well, I don't know. Not that I know of. I mean... It's good, solid Roman window. Win Roman window glass? I think so. It's got a shiny side here, and then absolutely flat, and then a matte side here where they cast it on a bed. Good Lord. It's very fine sand or something like that. To look at it, it's just like the, the stuff you put in the, the green bay of the bottle bank. Yeah, yeah. They come out of the top so I never gave it another thought. The thing which makes it not modern is the, the is matte the side and the shiny side. What, what would be the earliest for window glass, then? I just thought it was going strong in the second century, but, I mean, if we're right back in the 60s, things have hardly had time to sort of come in fashion yet. But is it impossible to have it no. that early? No, I mean, if you've got a fishbone or the Cotswolds, then you could have it in there, but it would have to be somewhere pretty spectacular. Yeah. Huh? It's a nice puzzle, anyway. Our discovery of glass adds to the mystery of our dig. The golden age of the villa in Britain didn't really happen until the 3rd and 4th century AD, but the majority of our finds point to an opulent house built within 20 or 30 years of the Romans arriving in Britain. And John's getting more evidence that the whole site is much bigger than we thought. John, the Geophys team have been working in this field for about seven hours <laughs> yeah. now. How far have you got? Well, we've done probably about a third of the field, and it feels like a lot bigger. It's looking incredibly impressive, though. I mean, we're looking at the magnetic plot now, because we can cover the ground more quickly, and it's showing this complex of ditches, a mm. big enclosure. Do you remember that curving anomaly I showed you I last do, yeah. night? It's just a, a big enclosure ditch, not Roman, I don't think, but we appear to have a Roman road crossing the site now. Is that these two parallel that's, lines? That's there. Yeah. Uh, and then more ditches um, in this area. And this is where Phil's trench is, here. Yeah. And in the resistance, we had the hint of some buildings. 
now we've expanded the survey, I, I think we've got a huge building range just over mm. there. If you look at the resistance plot, yeah, you can see clear wall lines, even a curving section mm. at that point. What does um, that look like at first glance to you, Mick? Well, I mean, it, it could be the, the apses that you get in a bathhouse. Yeah. But I think more likely, perhaps there up on up on the, the highest bit, perhaps is, you know, the main dining room with an apse at the back with where you had the table or the benches to uh, to dine at. Do we put a trench in there? I, I, th I think it'd be very useful, yeah. don't you, uh, to, to check between the... So after one and a half days of digging, we completely shift our search for the villa. And trench four goes in to investigate what we now hope will be the main living area. Painted wall plaster. And of course, why dig one trench when we can have two? So we'll investigate the possible Iron Age ditch as well. Will it go, just go deep? Let's go straight in there, shall we? We're closing down our trenches in our original field as we concentrate all our manpower on investigating Geophys's latest results. And as Roman Cotswolds expert Neil Holbrook happens to be in the area, we've decided to pick his brains too. And what's interesting to me is that you've got early Roman material coming off from Trenzer's building there. Now the question is, is this building later than that one? Does that one go out using they build that one or they actually yeah. in use at the same time? Yeah. So another trench here to get the chronology will be very useful. Mm. We've already got two trenches in that block because the one either side of the hedge are actually in that block there. So it'd be useful, I mean, Krenzer, perhaps you could do that, to yeah, do this yeah. one this end, yeah. just to test each end of that block. Well, that's fine because the trench over there in that field, we've really just about finished with, I think we've, we've Found we have got a deep ditch which yeah. has got stones packed in it as foundations for probably wooden building and I, I think that can be sort of mm. just left to finish off and record. Mm. We thought this was probably a big ditch and possibly mm. Iron Age. I mean if it is Iron Age then the question <coughs> is that's really interesting because you know what why have we got an Iron Age settlement and then an early Roman settlement so we've got the link between the end of the Iron Age and beginning of the Roman period. And it's half past five day two so yeah we've got to get on with it. Yep. So you need to go and pinch the digger. I'll go and speak to John and find right. out exactly where that needs okay. to go. Sure. With only an hour to go before the end of the day, the pressure's on in trench four as we search for a curved wall, evidence of a triclinium, a high status dining room. Still looking pretty straight. <laughs> <laughs> The vario focals. <laughs> there. <laughs> That's curved. That's curved. <laughs> Over in the newly opened trench six, Carenza's already finding evidence of the extent of the villa. Well, three stones in a row. That looks more like a wall than anything I've seen on this site so far. <laughs> okay, let's take it back then. And the extended trench one is still producing the goods, as it provides us with more clues to the lifestyle of the people who once lived here. It's going to be a nice bit of amphora, the big sort of uh, storage yard they use for transporting materials around. And you've got the um, handles coming off on that side and beginning of the side there. Right. Oh, it's yeah. quite loose. It's quite heavy. There we go. Oh. Yeah, nice way, isn't it? Up, uh, be that way, you can oh, see yes. the handles uh, going down nicely. I think it'll probably be one of the types that was um, used for transporting olive oil. Right, so they're having quite a good time here. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, with expensive pottery like this and the plate and glass windows we found earlier, we're obviously dealing with a rather sophisticated style of Roman life. And as the heavens open, Carenza finishes her day by hitting a floor within inches of the topsoil. That's starting to look like Opus Signinum slightly, isn't it? Pink, crushed tile in with it. It is, isn't it? Well, it's so dark I can hardly see colour. It? You told me that there would be a curvy apsoidal thing here, and all I can see is straight lines. Yeah, well, we're probably not quite far enough. It's this wall coming across here, yeah. and I reckon somewhere down here is about where it'll turn. 
This has just come up from it, which is a high quality glass vessel, a big glass jar, which is you know, perhaps what we'd expect from that sort of area. So whatever this Roman building is, we're now right at the heart of it. Join us after the break, and tomorrow we'll try and unlock its secrets. If we don't drown first. <laughs> yeah, <I'm kidding. laughs> and in a drier day three, blood is spilt as we race to complete our tribulum. Our finds reveal the personal side of the people who lived here. And after eight trenches, Time Team finally rebuild the villa that once stood here. It's the start of day three in the Cotswolds village of Whittington. With the help of Geophys, our search for an early villa is now concentrated on this field. And by the end of yesterday, Phil and Carenza had started to uncover major evidence of a large Roman building. But the trench that really grabs my attention is a large hole that doesn't even touch the main villa. We've got this huge ditch here, which everybody seems to think is probably Iron Age. Yeah, yeah. We've got this great tangle of villa-like structures here. Yeah. We've got some more structures down there. Both of these are Roman. Yeah. This clearly is before Roman times. Yeah. What's going on? Well, there isn't actually much difference in time between this ditch, which is late Iron Age, and the Roman stuff, which is early Roman. So there's probably no more than 50 years be between the two. And so one possibility is that people that were living here before the conquest just up sticks and moved 100 yards, but were very quickly living in Roman style buildings, using Roman pottery, material like that. And that would be very odd. And the only comparison I can think of is Fishbourne in, down in Sussex, which Barry Cunliffe excavated. And there what happened was that the, um, the Romans built a palace for the local tribal leader. The local tribe was pro-Roman, and it was like a sort of reward for letting them in, really. Now, I'm not suggesting exactly the same thing happened here, but it's, it's odd that it is so close in date. In, and the De Bunny, the local tribe, were pro-Roman. What about the stuff that Carenza dug during the first two days over there? I, I think that's now one of these big aisled halls that you get on one of these estates, which the farm labourers and the servants and the slaves live in, and where they do the craft work and they look after the animals. The geophysics looks like a great big open space. And I talked to, you know, Richard and people, and it's about the right distance away. You don't want it right outside the front door, but you don't want it too far away. So that's like the working part of the estate. This may well be the posh house. Just how posh a house could be answered by our dig in Trench 4, as Phil and John continue the search for the curved wall of the villa's opulent dining room. It, it's straight throughout the length of your trench. And it's only when you go beyond that there might be a curve. I can see it. Yeah. I don't know what it means. Does this mean that we're no. pressing to extend again? I, I think you might be. Well, I... I <laughs> but others have been luckier in their search for walls. After two frustrating days in our original field, Carenza's new trench has unearthed no less than three of them. It's brilliant. It's obviously part of the Roman building, but what's really exciting is we've got two separate walls. Why do you say two? Well, we've got one running along like this, and we've got one there. But the reason we know it's not just one wall turning is that this wall is built up against here. You can see oh, all yes, the stones yeah. here stop there. <laughs> And this line of stones runs right on, so it's not bonded in. Yeah. It's been built up against it. So we've clearly got two phases of a building here, if you like. And then we've got another wall up here, which we've just got the edge of coming along like that. Mm -hmm. And then even better, in the middle, we've got the remains of a floor level. So because we've got this floor in here, we know this is an inside, mm. the inside of a building. But what we don't know is which side of this wall is the inside and which is the outside. So we're going to widen the trench. Because we know at the floor level, what would be really great if we could find a doorway, a threshold or something. So we're just keeping our fingers crossed for that. And the other thing we want to do is lengthen the trench slightly to get the full width of this wall. And again, sort of contrast inside and outside. So get a bit more of the structure. So at last, a picture of this site may be starting to come together. And our probable Iron Age ditch is now producing evidence of a switch from a British way of life towards a more Roman one. From this dark brown material here, we've actually got 
two or three pieces of pottery coming out. Ah, you've got nice deep grooves on that. Oh, and you've got, that's actually the rim. I mean, I thought it was just broken off, but it's a very, very simple rim, just turned, turned over. So that must be in the late Iron Age tradition, but it's well baked in a Roman fabric. That's more solidly Roman. It's a good Roman shape in a Roman fabric. So we're going from just after the conquest up towards the end of the first century, I would have thought. Well, that's all right, because that's, that's actually quite high up in the ditch. You're still in the fill of the ditch. Oh, yeah, the, the ditch goes down well, yeah. another half a metre that we, we can see already. So, so, uh, so that's while is, the ditch is filling up yeah, rather than is, when it's first dug. Yeah, this is very, very high up in the ditch. Right, great. So we'll carry on and see what we can find. Yeah. We've already opened six trenches, but Mick obviously feels that isn't enough and seems intent on reaching double figures. Why do all these things always happen so bloody late? I think we've got time to do a couple if we don't take more than the topsoil off. Well, Crenza's trench is there. Yeah. And we're looking at that range. Yeah. We've got the, the range coming yeah, in so here. Yes, we've got a couple of trenches in there anyway, haven't we? So if we had one in yeah. this range here... OK, well, that looks, that looks sensible, doesn't it, to go for that? And as a second target, we've got the ditches surrounding um, right. the villa buildings yeah. here. And then in the corner, this high oh, resistance... Yeah. So it could be a no. tower, not, not necessarily defensive, but a garden feature or something like Possibly. that. Possibly. That's about right. If you pull it straight to me like that. Construction of a tribulum, a Roman threshing machine, is now well on course. The sled's been finished and the blades now need to be added, which gives Phil the rare opportunity of demonstrating his flint napping skills while digging a Roman site. I hope you won't feel offended. I have brought my own piece of flint. Hope that's all right. I rather suspected you would. What we've got to do is produce this cutter so that we can stick them lengthways into the wood. Oh, I see. So it's like a, a cutting machine. Let's see how we go on. I reckon your average Roman was not an accomplished flint napper. Now, I'm afraid my opinion of the Roman Romans as flint nappers is pretty... Pretty low. Pretty low. I mean, I can do, do that till the cows come home. Right. That's well, all right, isn't it? the cows won't be long now. <laughs> <laughs> That's just about cracking. All I want now is 148 more. Is that all? A stone of crows, you don't want much, do you? Back in the field, Trench 8's going in to gauge the size and style of the villa. The evidence we gather will help us interpret the geophys plan of the whole site, allowing graphics to recreate the buildings that would have once stood here. So we've got one clear building developed here, but we also know from the geophys we've got another structure here, quite a complicated building, running through back to the trenches we dug on day one. Right. So it looks like we've got quite a complicated series of buildings around, perhaps an open courtyard, difficult to say at this stage, but I think it looks like perhaps something like a farmyard, with a, a farmyard in the middle here with farm buildings around, dotted around at barns and that sort of thing. OK. But our model keeps changing, because not all the geophys results are what they seem. Our idea here was that we've got one range over there, one range over here, almost to be typical of a lot of plans that ought to be a range through here. And while we can't see it on there, you've got a mass of high resistance, which ought to be stonework. Yeah, and, well, when we look in the trench, we can't, we basically can't see anything. got natural. So although we were hoping for a range of buildings across here, it actually looks as if the high resistance you've got is actually reflecting the geology rather than anything archaeological. I, right. I don't think we fully understand it, but we can certainly say there's not a range of a building here. Right, so we're looking at two ranges here rather than three. Yes. Just after lunch on day three, and we now know the extent of the villa. 
and Carenza has unearthed an abundance of walls in Trench 6, suggesting it wasn't all built at the same time. This morning we just had this yeah, wall Which is very here. neat. Yes, and we had this turn here. Yes. Um, what we've got now is this wall carries on. We've got another wall coming mm -hmm. here, which is exactly parallel with that wall. That one wide. Both of them are just butted onto this wall. So I think they're all kind of related to each other, but probably two phases because it's butt joints. But the really confusing thing is mm. this room in here, yep. which we've got three walls surrounding it, none of which are parallel with each other. This one's really poorly built, so it's a really bizarre room. Yet for the whole trench, it's got the best floor in it. This is a real Roman worker day recycled floor. They would use pulverised bits of tile and pottery as hard core to pack with cement to make a really solid basic floor. This roof tile had to come from somewhere. Now what we might be dealing with in this floor is a floor that's been made up from a roof fall from perhaps an earlier part of the phase of the house. What I'd like to know is whether this Workaday recycle floor has actually been used as a repair overlaying an earlier floor. So there might be an earlier floor underneath. Well, I think that's a possibility. Well, I think in that case it would be extremely useful if we just put a small sondage in that corner to see what is below that. That's Otherwise, we'll never know. No, no, that's the only way you're going to find out. Hopefully, this sondage, a small exploratory trench, will confirm Guy's theory. Over in Trench 4, there's still no sign of the curved wall that's so clear on Geophys. But Phil has unearthed the earliest phase of the villa, a temporary kiln that may have fired some of the pots we've found on this site. No, so what have we got there? Then we've got, like, the stoke hole, the main firebox in there. Yeah. You can actually see the ashes here, and you can see the angle where they've been dragged out through the section there. But the main thing is that it must be the earliest thing in this trench, I think, because we've got this yellow clay floor, which I've been taken to be the floor that belongs to that building. Yeah, which is... And that covers that completely. Yeah, so this has been demolished. The yeah, finds just keep in. coming. In Trench 7, we've unearthed a fascinating insight into the beliefs of the villa's residents. Look at this, Tony. This is a pocket-sized altar for a household shrine, something that a Roman could take around with him. So this will have been something from the domestic shrine in this house with the family who lived here. It's like, that, like in the movie Gladiator, where the guy got the little... It's exactly the sort of thing. Gods. Yeah, that's right, the family gods, to take around with the person. So this is something he could have carried off with him for the day, or if he'd moved somewhere else, he would have taken this with him. And do we know whether this would have been early in the Roman period or late? Can't possibly tell, but it's a lovely little private piece of belief. And we're still finding evidence of the Britons who once occupied this site. This brooch, dating from the first 50 years AD, has just turned up in the extended trench one. It's possible it could be from a woman wearing a simple form of tunic which is not sewn across the shoulder but is held in place by a brooch one on either side. So you sort of step into it and pull it up and pin it? And pin it, it yes. Despite the excitement these finds generate, we haven't forgotten one of our major tasks over these three days, figuring out why this area had so many villas built so close together. And Stuart now thinks he may have cracked it. That's our villa site. That's the excavated Whittington Villa. This is Wickham, which is in effect a Roman settlement with a temple, a big street village. This is the thing we could see from the crop marks from the air, wasn't it? That's the one. Yeah. And there's another one up here at Arl Grove, which right. was discovered last century, although not fully investigated. Now, for someone like Stuart, this 2D map with all its contour lines makes perfect sense. But to help mere mortals like myself, we've turned the 2D map into a 3D model of this part of the Cotswolds. There's Wickham settlement there with the temple. Our villa is here, Algrove Villa, Whittington Villa. Can you see there's a big deep valley there, deep valley, escarpment edge here. And in effect, you've just got a, a narrow ridge down here which dictates where the villas are going to be situated. Mm -hmm. What's so attractive yeah. about this site? It's got all the ingredients you need for a, a working Roman farm economy. It's got nice fertile ground, which is well drained, got rivers and springs. It's got upland area here, which you need for Your pasture pasturing and animals and so on. Mm. It's got heavily wooded steep slopes, which you need for timber, for charcoal. And I think that's what this is actually telling us, that we've got three working farms, in effect, yeah. dividing yeah. up this landscape. Yeah. It's the only place they can actually 
put them. Short straw. <laughs> but I can see why this is high resistance. <laughs> it's putting up a lot of resistance for me, I know that. Is it just building rubble? Yep. Lots of stone, big lumps of it. Uh, fragments of broken roof tile. Uh, mortar. All the sort of thing you'd expect from a, a demolished wall, really. And look, red painted plaster. So you're in the red room. I'm then. going to call this the red room, yes. Carenza, you wanted another floor. Have you found one? Yes, we have. Right at the bottom here, here right. there's a mortar floor. Now, this goes underneath everything that way. OK. The great thing as well is that we know this wall is part of the earliest building showing in this trench. The inside room was there. Yes. This is outside. Mm -hmm. But at some stage after it's first built, we've got at least two rooms built on, one with that wall and one with that wall, with an area of garden or something in between. Richard? Yeah? What do you think this is? No, it's very simple, isn't it? You've just got the... just coming straight up and then just the rim flattened off. First bit of real Iron Age stuff, I should have thought. Excellent. Well, we'll carry on to find this piece of pot is final proof that we do indeed have an Iron Age ditch slap-bang up against our Roman villa. And thanks to all the finds from the last three days, our experts now have enough evidence to formulate their theories on the man and his family who first built a villa here. He's unusual. He started building a big villa within 20 years that the army came here. He spent a lot of money on it. I think he needed a big loan and he'd got to give his land the security. Look, if they're sitting down at dinner, Tony, with, incidentally, they will have paid for with the silver coins they've got here. We know they had access to oyster shells imported. We know they were able to buy wine amphorae because we found that. They could even pay a man to put wall plaster to decorate the walls in the room that they were sitting down to dine but, in. And we know there was a woman because there was a spindle wall. So there's a whole run of society here. There's things like the brooch and the imported pottery that comes in late Iron Age, but we found it in a Roman context. So it's, they're moving from the Iron Age to the Roman. And yet sometime fairly early on during the Roman occupation, this place closed down. Why? The loan sharks foreclosed. I think that's a perfectly plausible idea, but we don't know anything about land ownership. It's quite possible that somebody else had bought them out. Maybe they decided they'd like a bigger and better house somewhere else and moved to a nicer location. Well, there's plenty of other villas around here that they could have gone to and the occupation started at that time. That's it? absolutely possible, yeah. And as day three draws to a close, we've just got enough time to complete our other major task, building a tribulum. And Peter Reynolds now knows firsthand just how sharp Phil's flint blades are. And it's the last flint, too. I managed to avoid everything up until that. <laughs> now all we have to do is drag our threshing machine over some wheat, which also proves to be more hazardous than we expected. Come on. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Would it be easier to take the stone whoa, off? Whoa, whoa, yeah, take the stone off. Steady. All right. There we go. Yeah, now she should run. No, then, let's see her there. That's better. Under the weight of the sled, Phil's super sharp flint blades are crushing and chopping the ears of wheat. And it's working. Oh, yes. I mean, you can actually see, you can actually yeah. see the, the grains of corn in the ground. Yep. It's then a matter of literally separating the wheat from the chaff. Yeah. That's all you got to do, winnow it out. That's it. And then you're home and dry. And you've got the chaff for the livestock to feed them, and you've got the stuff to make the bread with. <laughs> We came here because of one small wall. And in just three days, we've managed to paint a really good picture of what life must have been like in these fields nearly 2,000 years ago. Over there, a long villa building, incorporating all the new Roman technology that its owner could either find or afford. Over there, another villa building, probably the business end, incorporating things like the kitchen. And behind that hedge, a massive aisled building for the slaves and the farm workers and the cattle. But what about the owner? Maybe he got rich and moved on. 
Maybe he misjudged everything and lost his house and all his money. But what we can be pretty sure of is that he was someone who dived into the new Roman culture and ideas headfirst. Must have been great while it lasted. <laughs>